Good morning and welcome to Chesapeake College. Uh, thank you all for making the trip out here today. It's a gorgeous day outside, so thank you for being willing to spend the day inside with us. Uh, my name is Greg Farley and I'm the chairman of the uh, Center for Leadership in Environmental Education here at the college, which makes me the sustainability point person for us. Um, and I'm gonna take a couple minutes just to sort of orient you to who we are as a college and why we're part of this conversation and then a little bit about what we're doing today. And then I'm gonna turn the show over to Nioma because uh, she has really been the driving and organizing force behind everything. My, I, my contention is I think that Nioma has talked to all of you. Is that correct? I think she's talked to pretty much everybody in the room this morning. So she's put a lot of work into this. Um, to prepare for my transition out of teaching faculty here at the college, I was hired 13 years ago as member of the biology faculty. Um, and to prepare for my transition into sustainability, uh, I went to Hawaii. I took a sabbatical, and I took five months, and I went to Hawaii. And that's the reaction I usually get, right? You know, they say, oh yeah, tough gig, right? The reason I went to Hawaii is because sustainability is at the forefront of what they do. And it's driven by a lot of factors. It's driven by the fact that gasoline is $5 a gallon. It's driven by the fact that electricity is four and a half times what we pay for it here on the Eastern Shore. Um, so sustainability makes a lot of sense from a fiscal responsibility standpoint in Hawaii. Well, one of the things I figured out very early on, and one of the things that made it into the book that chronicles a little bit of what I did, um, is that food security, agriculture, and like issues are at the heart of the successful sustainability effort for Hawaii. You cannot talk about the preservation of agriculture without talking about whether it feeds people in the islands. You can't talk about hunger and food security in the islands without talking about Hawaiian culture and the importance of people to agriculture and the importance of food to people. And so I discovered very early on, and the, um, you know, a little bit of shameless self-promotion, but the book is actually out now, and I have a copy today if you'd like to see it. But food security is so central to sustainability in Hawaii that it's one of the first two chapters in the book. The first chapter is on Hawaiian culture the second one is on food. And then chapters three and four are both about agriculture and the resurgence of local, food-driven, people-driven agriculture for the state of Hawaii. So I think we're at a similar place here. The reason I went to Hawaii is it looks a lot like the Eastern Shore. It's a lot of large, uh, large agriculture plots, mostly there at sugarcane and pineapple instead of corn and soybeans, but it's a, there's a lot of large agriculture. There's also a very healthy, very vibrant, small ag community, and that's growing by leaps and bounds. Their distribution of territory to, looks a lot like the Eastern Shore. There's a lot of farmland and small, small towns studded in between. The big city in Maui, where I was, is Kahului. It's about the same size as Easton. So they're a great model for us. And one of the things I learned is that the lessons I brought back from Hawaii can be applied to what happens here on the shore. And that's why we're here this morning. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the support and the, the uh, impetus of the Town Creek Foundation. I think Megan is here. But thank you for, to Town Creek for bringing this project to the college and for funding our efforts. Um, I'd like to thank the, all of you who are on the ground helping people. At the end of today, I think we'll have taken a significant step towards having fewer hungry neighbors, towards having more resilient farms, towards having an agriculture system here that is better able to serve the region in terms of what people need and better able to make a profit and better able to turn uh, soil over and make soil health a better, uh, at better value for the, the, pre, the agricultural system to come. The, there are a lot of factors in this room. Everybody here this morning is wearing a name tag that doesn't have your silo on it. It doesn't say where you're from. Mine doesn't say Chesapeake College, and I know many of you, and I know which silos you belong to. My, our hope is that we've mixed you up enough that we can develop a really rich conversation about the future of food, agriculture, food security, and all of those issues for the Eastern Shore this morning. So I'd like to thank, begin by thanking all of you preemptively for your participation today. Please feel free to think out loud, think outside the box, be creative, be forceful, be participatory, and by all means, at the end of the day, feel proud of what you've done. So thank you very much for being here this morning. 
I'm going to turn the show over to Neoma Roman, who's really in charge. I really work for her. So uh, without further ado, Neoma. Having you here um, gives me a lot of hope. Um, in my little write-up here, I'll tell you a little bit about my background, but uh, I come from a community that was broken by circumstances, um, and we never really recovered. And so seeing this room full of people who are here and ready to at least talk about it um, is enough to, to make me well up a little bit. So, so that's something. All right. Okay, I want to thank you for taking the time to come here and participate in this conversation. And that's mission. We're not here to just hear me talk at you, although you'll get plenty of that this morning. We're here to have a conversation with the other members of the Midshore Food Systems community. We have farmers, environmentalists, producers, um, not many transportation people here, unfortunately. No waste stream people. Oh well. Environmentalists by the boatload, it seems like and pretty much everybody else who's involved in the food system um, here on the Eastern Shore. I want you to look around. This is your community, whether you realize it or not. These are your peers. These people here are your tribe. Your time is valuable. I want to honor that. This is going to be a very intense day, so we're pretty precisely scheduled. Um, I'm hoping that you will give me permission to marshal you around a bit. I have a relatively tight schedule, and I'm going to get on the microphone and say, okay, it's time to go here, here, and here. Are you guys okay with that? Of course. Okay, thank you. Let's begin. Somebody asked me this morning about my name, and I said, well, wait till the talk. So my name is Neoma. Neoma is a Cherokee name. Um, there's a reason you've never heard of it. There's not many of us left. The Cherokee, like many cultures that survived relatively intact for millennia, lived mostly in balance with the land and with each other. Practices that maintained the equilibrium within their society, one of which was the respect for the land, and another of which was the tradition of working through their problems as a community. A panel of elders chosen by the community would convene, share stories and grievances, pass the pipe, and come up with a solution that was consistent with their community values and was informed by the greater good. You guys, all of you, Every one of you were asked here today because you are the leaders of your tribes. Agriculture, environmental, hunger, economic development, transportation, land use. You are the panel of elders here on the Eastern Shore. And the issues we have come here to discuss today are those of the food system of the Eastern Shore. Today, we will be laying the groundwork for a food system strategic plan for the five county region served by this college. We will do this via two exercises, the first of which is a conversation mapping exercise in which we will identify themes in your collective conversations. The second part will be an exercise which will allow us to identify areas of strength and weakness within the existing system as well as areas of common obstacles and opportunities. Who thinks she's young? Who thinks she's old? Who doesn't know yet? No, okay, then I need to see all the hands up. Who thinks she's young? Who thinks she's old? Look around you. You can't all be right. I love these things. So this is Hildegard. And she's here to remind you that even when you're sure you're right, sometimes if you take a moment to look at things a little bit differently, you may see the picture in a whole new light. Let's try another one. Yeah, this is the dress that broke the internet. Look at the picture and please tell me with a show of hands, how many of you know that this dress is blue? How many of you know that this dress is gold or white or whatever you weirdos see? <laughs> yeah. 
I, I don't understand. My husband swears it's gold. I gotta believe you. I gotta believe you. All right. But think to yourself, think how certain you are looking at that dress. You know that that dress is blue or you know that that dress is whatever color you guys see. I look at it and I would bet my house that it's blue and black, plain as day. I'd bet my house because that's the color that it is, right? Anyway, so either you guys are gaslighting me or we all see the world very differently. All right. Pretty sure most of you are wrong, though. All right. So this dress is here to tell you, regardless of how sure we are about something and how wrong the other guy is, we might both be looking at the same thing, just from different perspectives. Many of the food systems issues I discovered in my research were points of contention for two or more stakeholder groups, not surprisingly. Yet I can't help but notice that we all love this land and have a strong affinity for its people. <sighs> our recent discovery of our differences uh, dictates that perhaps our goals are more similar than we realize. Perhaps if we shift our perspectives a little, just a little, we may come to see these obstacles as opportunities instead. <clears throat> so somebody asked me about my background this morning also and why I got into this work. So I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a downer, but so. Um, I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm certainly not here to tell you what you're doing wrong and what you should do to fix it. I certainly don't know all the answers. Um, but I have seen something like what we have going on here uh, in the five county region. I've seen something like this before and I, I want to help. I want to help before it's too late for you guys to. <clears throat> I grew up in the rainforests of Oregon. I don't know if you guys know this, but there are rainforests in Oregon. Yeah, pretty cool. And my father, like every other father in our community, was a logger. The forests of my youth were awesome, and I thought at the time, never ending. And like most deeply rural communities, the only industry we had was to harvest our natural resources. Sadly, clear cutting pushed them to the brink of extinction. And what little remains today was saved, in part, by environmental groups leveraging the newly formed Endangered Species Act. Some of you may remember these little guys. These are the spotted owls. The spotted owl was the pressure point environmental groups used to shut down what remained of the logging industry in our area. And while I now know that they had the best of intentions, they put my father out of work and every other father in our community. I grew up on government assistance, or at least the little amount of assistance that my mother would deem to take. We survived by growing and putting up our own food, and that's a habit I still continue today. My father got another job, this time fishing for salmon in the river, but that didn't last long either. The salmon population plummeted with the building of the dams, and the rivers became choked with clouds of silt washing into the river from the now denuded hillsides. It's a funny thing when you remove trees from hills, the hills fall down. His last job was working as a laborer in a paper mill. He spent the remainder of his working years jackhammering concrete in an incredibly toxic environment. Unfathomably to me as a youth, and despite the silicosis that eventually crippled him, he still considered himself lucky. And now I know that he was lucky. He was lucky to even have found a job. There were and are too few to go around. Most of our community disappeared into the hole of joblessness, helplessness, and hopelessness, eventually succumbing to depression, desperation, drugs, or poverty-related diseases. So I guess you could say I'm kind of an expert. I know firsthand the consequences of environmental devastation and the equally devastating effects of abruptly ending those practices that support indigenous communities. I know about hunger and what happens to workers when they have no choice but to take any job offered. I know poverty and being given so little that you can't even figure out what's missing. I know the dangers of putting all our eggs in one basket. 
You can say, I'm a bit of an expert on the consequences of living exclusively for yourself or for today without consideration of the future or the wider community. I don't want to see that happen to anybody else, and most especially not here in my new home on the shore. So, as a result, I've chosen a role as a community sustainability and resiliency coordinator. And it's a big title. You guys have all seen it on the bottom of my email. What does that mean? Communities. I only work with small and medium-sized communities like, like those here on the shore. Community is the heart of who we are and it needs to be fostered. Sustainability. Is what we're doing right now or what we're planning on doing sustainable? In other words, can we keep this up for seven generations, which is 140, year, 140 years? If the answer is no, then we're just robbing our grandchildren. Resilience. Are we strong? Do we have the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties? Have we planned for that bolt from the blue? Coordinator. I'm here to coordinate your efforts to make the midshore the best possible version of itself. To that end, I've interviewed hundreds of people involved in food systems work here on the Eastern Shore and the surrounding areas. Some of you snuck in from Baltimore, I saw you. Including most of you in this room. And here is an overview of what you told me are the areas with the greatest opportunities for improvement. <clears throat> number one on the list, and number one on my list also, farm, farmer, and farmland viability. We ain't going nowhere without our farmers. I'll tell you that right now. They are the heart of this community. They are what we are gonna be building our future upon. They're here to stay. Environment, environmental is number two on my list for all the reasons I talked about earlier. Primarily bay health. Farmland number one, bay number two. Nobody wants to visit a place where you can't let your dog swim in the water. We gotta work on that, people. Poverty and related diseases. I decided to exclude the numerous and wonderfully interesting slides about how some of our population has fallen off the edge of our attention span. Um, poverty in this area is rampant. Over a third of the people in our average communities are considered living in poverty, and that's not a pretty place to be. And the problem with poverty is it's something we can do something about. Resilience, monocropping, food security, these are all things that we need to talk about and work on. These are things that have come up in these conversations that people are saying, yeah, you know, I'm not really sure what would happen if X, Y, or Z, or if you know who left. Sorry. Transportation and logistics. Almost every one of you talked about transportation and logistics. Guess how many of transportation and logistics people showed up here today? One, two. We need to talk to these people. Everybody is talking about them. We need to talk to them. Education. This is a little broad because it covers a lot of ground. We need to educate our consumers, both here on the Eastern Shore and outside in the surrounding regions, about what it means to eat local foods and support local farms. We need to educate our consumers, especially in low-income communities, but also in regular-income communities, that eating a leafy green vegetable that was picked by your neighbor is a lot better for you than something else you can get at a certain trademarked place, I shouldn't say. Education, producers. We need to educate some of our farmers. They've been doing the same thing for a long time, getting the same results. I'm calling them crazy. There are a lot of things that are going on right now that can benefit our farmers. There's a lot of money out there to help with education. Hoop houses to increase year-round growing. Some farmers I talk, about, I talk to don't have any idea that any of these opportunities are available. New farmers. You guys want to guess what the average age of a farmer is here on the Eastern Shore? You wish. 65. Where's the farmer of the future, folks? We got a <laughs> young. We, 65 years young, yes. High five, boys. <laughs> we got to start thinking about this yesterday. Marketing, economic, de oh, sorry, economic development. 
creating a food-based economy. I really think that food is our future. This is part of the reason I'm doing this. But we've got an incredible opportunity to take advantage. We've got 42 million people within 200 miles of this room waiting for our boutique this and our specialty that. That market's out there. We're not really organized enough to meet the demand reliably yet. We need to talk about that. Marketing. Marketing, marketing affects all of you, not just because when we sell our products to that big mass of people, they need to know that we have a, conveni uh, a consistent, safe brand. We also need to start policing ourselves because if we start to build some momentum with our marketing and we start to get a market and one of these guys who's selling meat that's not theirs, that they're getting at the auction, and somebody figures that out and then puts it on 60 Minutes or CNN, that rotten apple is going to ruin the barrel for all of us. We need to start working on some self-policing. Okay. But enough lecturing. Ah, just kidding. More lecturing. All right. All of these issues are large, complex, and inextricably woven together. Any solutions will require the involvement of the food system community at large. It is my hope that today we'll begin this dialogue and lay the path to the midshore of tomorrow. If you work together, you guys have the knowledge, you guys have the power, you guys have the ability to improve all aspects of our community. Are you ready to start working? Yes. Are you ready to start working? Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right, here we go. Conversation mapping. I really like this technique. Um, I first learned about it uh, about a year ago when my, my new boss, who's sitting back there, suggested I go to this wacky meeting in Cambridge. And I'm really glad that he did, because it's pretty cool. Conversation mapping is a way to get a lot of information from a lot of people in a very short time, which is what we have, a very short time. This technique will allow us all to have numerous conversations simultaneously but without the noise and chaos of a group conversation. How do you think we're going to do this? You're not allowed to talk. 